This episode of SciShow is supported by Skillshare. Welcome to SciShow Quiz Show, the only quiz show called SciShow Quiz Show. Is that true? As far as I know, <laughs> that is completely accurate. If you start I'm... up another one, let us know. <laughs> I'm Michael Aranda, your host for today. We have the always colorful Hank Green. Get it? Because his last name's Green. Oh. It's colorful. <laughs> I didn't think that was that good of a joke, but it was in the script, so I'll I say laughed it. twice and a fake laugh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she gave you two fake laughs. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, he'll be facing off against Jesse Knudsen Castaneda. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jesse is the host of SciShow Kids and our sister channel, Animal Wonders, which, as of this August, the nonprofit will be celebrating its 10 year anniversary. Whoa. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That doesn't seem possible. You I know. Like, you look like you're 16. Well, I've been doing it since I was six then. <laughs> <laughs> our contestants will be battling for intangible bragging rights, but also for very tangible prizes which will actually go to two of our patrons from Patreon that we've selected at random. Ooh. Hank, you're competing on behalf of Charles Rosenberg. Hello, Charles. And Jesse, yes. you're playing for Amy O'Brien. Hi, Amy. Each of you begin with 1,000 SciShow points. Okay. Answer a question correctly, and that number goes up. Answer incorrectly, and that number goes down. Whoever emerges from the last round with the most points wins their patrons some slick gear. But is it going to actually be slick? No. That's that a sounds, lie, then. That sounds gross. <laughs> Stefan, show our contestants what they could go home with today. Okay, listen up. Amy and Charles, both of you are getting the cards from today's final round, which will be signed by both of our contestants. But only today's winner will take home the I Won SciShow Quiz Show pin, as well as a fine selection of top secret swag. The loser won't go home with an empty loot bag, though. They'll receive the I Lost SciShow Quiz Show pin, so there's nothing to feel bad about here. But that's all I know, so good luck, contestants, and back to you. Thank you, Stefan. It's time for our first round. Put on your anthropologist hat because the first round is all about the human animal. We like to think that our species is special, but we're basically just fancy no. mammals. No, I'm totally special. We build buildings and cars. <laughs> animals are, other animals are special in their own ways, but I'm yeah. special in my own way. I'm just reading the script, <laughs> gee dang it. <laughs> Sorry to get like... So angry. So <laughs> vulgar, yeah. cut, cut it out, cut it out. out. <clears throat> This round's questions put us in proper context with the rest of animal life. Okay. Scientists can learn a lot about our evolutionary history by comparing homologous structures, mm. parts of our bodies mm -hmm. that share a common ancestry with parts of other animals. For example, they can look at the shape of the bones and muscles in our legs and ankles and compare them to apes and hominid fossils to better understand how our species came to walk on two legs. Mm -hmm. Looking at more general traits can also reveal key changes that occurred in our ancestors when they left the comfort of the oceans for new shores. Mm. So, way back. the question is, which of these traits is not found in fish and is likely an adaptation to life on land? Ooh, not okay. in fish. Color vision, oh. tongues, what? nostrils, or ears with hair cells? Oh my gosh. What? Oh, I forgot the beginning. Um, oh, I feel like all those things. I'm gonna say color vision. That is incorrect, oh I'm afraid. Oh gosh, I'm gonna say Hairy ear cells. It's tongues. Really? No. Fish don't have tongues. <laughs> oh, they. Because they just suck it in. Yeah. And we don't. We can't do that because we. You can't just suck in air. You can suck in Jello. I suck in air all day long. <laughs> but but it doesn't bring food with it. Okay. It's just a weird meat tentacle in your mouth. And yeah. It's there all the time. Blah, 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 blah. It, it's really weird. I talk about tongues of the animals, they're like, look at his tongue! And I'm like, yeah, you want to hear about the tongue? It's like dry and like a finger in their mouth. Or it's right, like yeah. long and sticky and like lots yeah, like of weird. Yeah, bird, like bird tongues are tongues just are super scaly, weird. hard. They're not like their skin, but it's just like this like it's like, it's it's like, like, you know what it looks like? It looks like the, the pad of a dog's foot. Oh, similar. Yeah. And a, but in your mouth. Yeah. And not, and dry. Not wet. Yeah, not wet. Yep. I yep. like my tongue to be wet. Me it's like too. tortoises then. Tortoises have good, wet, meaty tongues. 
Now just wiggle that tongue around in your mouth a little and then appreciate that you can do that because no fish can. While some fish may have what looks a bit like a tongue, that is the floor of their mouth mounds up a little, it contains no voluntary muscles and is thus not considered the real deal. Tongues first appear in the lineage we share with amphibians, reptiles, birds, and other mammals, a group called the tetrapods. These lingual structures are essentially co-opted gill muscles, which became freed from their previous job by the transition to breathing air. Researchers think we probably have them because it's harder for us land animals to move food into our digestive systems. Tongues help manipulate meals and ensure they're swallowed, since you can't just like run really fast and have the force of air push things down your throat. And don't try that at home. So in addition to tongues, which are endlessly fascinating, <laughs> we also have lots of other things in common with our fellow mammals, so much so that scientists often use them as proxies when they want to better understand diseases. That's basically the entire justification for animal research. Understand how a disease works in a mouse, and you can learn a lot about how to treat it in humans. But there's a catch to that. Studies have found that our species can be very different from the usual lab organisms, even at the cellular level. Hmm. For example, there are lots of cancers that we can induce and then cure cure in mice that we can't seem to wrangle in our own bodies. And researchers in the 1980s discovered that human beings also stand out when it comes to the abundance and size of a specific kind of cell, which are essential regulators of our body's metabolism. Mm. What are they? Neurites, erythrocytes, adipocytes, or keratinocytes? Mm. I'm gonna say adipocytes. Well, yeah! you would be correct. Ah, I was, I was I mostly a guess. <laughs> That's right, human adipocytes, or fat cells, are an outlier of sorts. When scientists counted up the fat cells in more than 200 mammals, they found that we humans have about 10 times as many of them as expected for our size. Those cells are a lot smaller than they should be too. In general, larger animals have larger fat cells, but ours are about the same size as a rat. So we have a whole lot of small fat cells, which is really weird. Since carnivores and other species with fat and protein-rich diets tend to have more cells, researchers think that may partially be a reflection of our ancestors diet. But there's also something uniquely human about our fat, as even our closest relatives are lean machines by comparison. These strange fat cells are part of why we put on and store fat differently than other mammals, especially differently than rodents. And since our model organisms kind of fail to reflect this, that's made studying metabolic diseases much harder. So that brings us to the end of round one. Let's take a look at how our contestants are doing. Ooh, Jesse, 900 what? points. Yep. Hank, 1100 points. I can still win. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can lose no matter what. <laughs> Sorry, Amy, it's not really good, but I will try. I can always find a way to lose. I just need to point out that the script right here says, looks like losing contestant. Better hope they know more about our next round's category. <laughs> Better hope. <laughs> <clears throat> That's my new name. Yeah. Okay, uh, our next category is Animal Wonders. No, really? Studying animals doesn't just help us understand our own evolution. Lots of species have really neat ways of solving everyday problems. So in recent years, biomimetics and bionics, technologies copying or inspired by nature, have taken off. The questions in this category are all about some truly wonderful things that animals can do and the technologies that they've inspired. I'm so excited right now. Oh, animal <laughs> wonders. One such animal is the polar bear. Not only do they inspire us to cut down on fossil fuels, they've also inspired researchers as these iconic animals are able to eke out a living in a pretty extreme environment. Mm -hmm. To survive in the icy Arctic, they've evolved some neat adaptations. Their paws are huge, for example, which allows them to act like snowshoes when the animals travel over snowy slopes and paddles when they swim. But it's a different adaptation of theirs, one that helps them survive the biting cold that has inspired biological engineers hoping to keep humans warm. What polar bear trait is inspiring materials that retain heat better? Hmm. The white fur, thick blubber, black skin, or rough paw pads? I feel like it's gotta be the fur. That is correct. Oh, I feel like that was a trick question. But it's all, it's... We'll hmm. find out. I need to know the answers now. Obviously having white fur is helpful if you want to blend in with snowy slopes, but there's a lot more to polar bear coats than the color. It turns out they're a super important part of how the animal keeps warm. See, their hairs are basically hollow. They're made from clear proteins and have tons of tiny air pockets, kind of like a honeycomb. Among other things, this allows them to reflect infrared light, 
also known as heat. When the body heat they generate starts to radiate outward, it hits the hairs and bounces back, keeping the bears warm. It works so well, in fact, that it inspired engineers to design a hollow fibered blanket that acts as a wearable heater. A textile of it debuted this year. The hollowness of the hairs was mimicked using a special technique called freeze spinning, which allowed ice crystals to form as a liquid water silk mix was pulled into threads. And when those fibers were freeze dried, the ice sublimated, leaving a porous fiber. And when woven into a cloth, these fibers were able to almost completely conceal a rabbit from an infrared camera, demonstrating their ability to retain heat by reflecting infrared light. So polar bears fur might lead to better blankets and invisibility cloaks, but they're just the tip of the iceberg. Invisibility cloaks. It? Apparently it's it? something to tip do with it. Tip of the iceberg, I got it. Okay, okay. It. <clears throat> um, so it's time for question four. Parasitic worms aren't exactly Ooh. beloved, uh, but perhaps they... <laughs> Have you met some? Who? Have you, do you have any? Uh, do you keep any animal Did you bring wonders? Any with you? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Chris. Perhaps, though, they should get a little more credit. <laughs> they might actually be good for our immune systems, as we've explained in a previous SciShow episode. And they're also inspiring some super handy medical tech. The wormy muses in this case are Pomphrenchus levis. It's ultimately a parasite of fish, but it uses small aquatic crustaceans called amphipods as intermediate hosts. Yeah. The worms can actually manipulate the amphipods to make them more likely to be eaten by interfering with their natural fear of its predator's scent, as well as changing the amphipods color. Ooh. Then, as adults, wow. these parasites set up shop in a fish's intestine, hooking into the intestinal wall with their spiky heads. Yeah. The question is, what medical technology have these worms inspired? Okay. An adhesive, a surgical implement, a sponge, or a hormonal implant? Oh boy, I don't know Dang. any of those things. Uh, it's A or the last one. You should Where's the letter A, B, C, D? It's A or D. <laughs> A or the fourth oh, one. Say, um, change your color and scent. Hormonal implant. That's what I would that have said. Incorrect. That's what I would have said. You should have let me hit the button. <sighs> I'm gonna go. What was the first one? Dang adhesive. it. <laughs> An adhesive? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What were the other two? You also have surgical implant and sponge. A sponge? That sounds like it doesn't make any sense at all. So I'm gonna go with sponge. <laughs> that is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it didn't make any sense at all. Uh, the answer was adhesive. Oh, worm tape. That's what they call it. It's like duct tape, but worms instead of ducks. Right now, when doctors want to stick something like a tissue graft to part of the human body, they have a few choices, but a lot of them tend to cause reactions or other damage. Enter worm tape. How the worms attached to the intestinal wall inspired medical researchers to develop a new, safer adhesive to stick to soft tissue. See, the worms have a spiny proboscis, or mouth part, which they insert into the intestinal wall. Once in, the whole thing swells from an influx of fluid, and that anchors it in place strongly. For the worm to let go, all it has to do is deflate. And that ability to adhere and then let go is just what scientists were looking for. Their new adhesive, a tape of sorts, is covered in teeny plastic microneedles, which consist of a hard core with a thin membrane. When the needles penetrate skin, they absorb water and swell, just like the spiny worm's proboscis. And that allows each to anchor in with enough strength to be useful without causing much damage. The microneedle tape stuck skin grafts in place better than staples, and the developers say the applications are almost limitless. That concludes our second round. So let's take a moment to check in our on our contestants going into the final round. Jesse has 800 points. I don't remember if I called them points or bucks this episode. You called them points. Uh, okay. Hank, you have 1,200 points. Okay. Well, winning contestant might have the upper hand for now, but it all comes down to your bets and how you answer the question in our last round. Get ready to dig deep into your intellectual reserves to determine how much you know about kids. We both have those. I have kids. <laughs> so while Hank and Jesse are deciding how much they're going to bet, Hank is going to tell us all about Skillshare. Hank. Yeah. While you and Jesse are writing down your wagers over mm -hmm. there. In a different in shirt. In a different time. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few questions about our sponsor. It's Skillshare. That is correct. Hank, do you know how many classes Skillshare offers? I'm going to guess 1,400. 1,400? I don't know. How is it? Hank, is it less than Skillshare that? has more than 20,000 <gasps> courses. Oh, that's a lot. I thought I overguessed. Okay, question number three. Mm -hmm. What class did you take most recently 
This is a hard one, so take your time. <laughs> I think the most recent Skillshare class I took was a Photoshop class. I'm getting trying to get better at Photoshop because I use a very outdated photo editing software. So trying to get better at Photoshop and Illustrator is one of my main things right now so that I don't have to send people layered PNGs anymore. I can send them PSDs and they'll always stop yelling at me about it. <laughs> it's great. You make a thing as you're doing it and learn where everything is, is mo mostly what I need to learn. Cause I like, I know how to do design, right, but right. I need to know where the button Click is here. and how the layers work and masking is different in Photoshop. And I just need to know how all that stuff works. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next question is, how can our viewers that's you, get two free months of Skillshare. I think, Stefan, they can click on the link in the description. You've answered this question correctly. Oh man, I'm killing it. And our final question today is gonna be, who do you think is gonna win the quiz show? I mean, I don't even remember. I, we did this in the past and I don't remember who won. I don't know if you've watched <laughs> quiz show before, but I'm not super passionate about winning. Did I win? Do I don't you? remember. <laughs> no, <laughs> none of us know. Let's go find out. Welcome back from that commercial break. Speaking of kids, I have a surprise. You have a surprise. I have a surprise. Did you bring me a small goat? I know, but I brought you something small okay. and cute. Is it a baby? And hopefully will really distract you so I can win. Oh, wow. Well. <gasps> oh, are they baby guinea pigs? Baby guinea pigs! Oh no, you're Ooh. too cute. I did, oh gosh, I didn't know baby guinea pig would be so cute. They're ridiculously cute. They're so cute, hi. <laughs> I had a friend who had a guinea pig when I was growing up, uh, and the guinea pig was really mean. Oh yeah, and, defensive. And so I really didn't, well yeah, I don't want to say that it was a no, bad guinea mean. pig, yeah. but it, it was a biter and a yeller. <laughs> and and so I always thought guinea pigs were no good, but oh gosh. They, they can be good. They can oh, like humans. Especially Look this, oh my gosh. How old are they? These guys are three weeks old. <gasps> what are they like when they come out? This, but half the size. But they're fuzzy and cute like they're this? They're like this, but yeah, they're like, huh. oh, no. they're basically, their bodies are smaller. So they're, it's like their head and their body are the same size. <laughs> it looks a lot like a porg. So it, I like the part yes, where it basically is the shape of a softball, but it has a face. <laughs> well, uh, if you thought that the question was about tiny humans, uh -oh. it's actually about goats. It's about little goats. <laughs> <laughs> Goats were domesticated at least 10,000 years ago, making them among our oldest animal companions. And they've become a huge part of human cultures worldwide. And that's in spite of the fact that they look really interesting with the, the sideways pupil thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yep. <clears throat> well, it turns out that the shape tells us a lot about the animal's lives. A 2015 study found that pupil shape predicted whether an animal was predator or prey. Mm -hmm. And those horizontal rectangles, those are found on food, not okay. hunters. What about you, guinea pig? You got all only pupil. Eyes on the side. You're a prey. <laughs> You're meat. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> I don't have eyes on the side. But you're still meat. Oh yes, correct. <laughs> Where are you going, buddy? Jeez. So why do scientists think that is the case? Just answer it. Oh, sorry, good. Nope. This is a, you're gonna you're gonna <laughs> write your choice. answer on the card here. <clears throat> Whoa. <laughs> Hank is bad at that. <laughs> Like this, Hank. Okay, like this. Oh, it works. You're right. <laughs> you're, you're, it's, like you're, it's like this is your job. <laughs> Are horizontal rectangular pupils found on prey because mm. they're better for night vision, they're better for depth perception, they widen the field of vision, or they are a side effect of faster eye muscles? Oh. Yeah. Do you, yep. do you yep. need help? Oh, I got it. <laughs> oh, okay. We got it. We okay. made the same mark. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like they made the same noise. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're going to show your answer to this camera. Hank, you're going here. You're both correct. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think that means that uh, Hank. Oh, he's uh, the winner. winner. Yeah. 2,400 points. This is my new thing. I just bet them all. 
I, Just I mean, them all. Yeah, you got to. The answer is C. They widen the field of vision. Pupil shape affects the light that comes into the eyeball, and therefore, what an animal can see. And in the animal kingdom, they come in a diverse array of shapes. So in this study, which was published in Science Advances, researchers wondered whether different lifestyles led to the evolution of those shapes. They took 214 animals and compared the degree of their pupil's vertical or horizontal elongation with the animal's lifestyle. Things like whether it's a predator or prey, or whether it's nocturnal. And the pattern was clear. Nocturnal and ambush predators have vertical slits. Most prey, including goats, have horizontal ones, and all other hunters tend to have round pupils. Which all makes sense. Slits in general allow for greater control of how much light the eye lets in, which is why animals that are nocturnal, or active both at night and day, tend to have them, and why we don't. But slits can also alter the animal's sight. And in this case, the goat's horizontal pupils give it incredible panoramic vision. Goat vision can see up to 340 degrees at a time. Basically everything except what's directly behind them. In comparison, our field of vision is about 120 degrees. And I guess it's not hard to see why looking at the world with a wide-angle lens would help these prey out. It's basically impossible to sneak up on a goat. A big thank you to Skillshare for supporting SciShow. Skillshare is offering SciShow viewers two months of Skillshare for free. To get access to over 20,000 classes, just click on the referral link in the description. Pretty sure there aren't any about guinea pigs, I'm sorry. But mostly everything else. <laughs>